Hi, my name is Noah Gift, and today I'm going to talk about some of the operational issues with machine learning. Also talk a little bit about Tesla's 2021 AI day and how we can advantage ourselves by learning from their experience and what are some of the things that they're doing that we can apply to real world ML uh, ops. And then finally, I get into how AWS can be used for uh, a final target for ML ops deployment. Let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, I think a good place for me to start today is to uh, just talk a little bit about the uh, architecture for Tesla's uh, self-driving car system. And one of the things that, that's, I think, not really mentioned a lot uh, about a self, fully self-driving car system is that it, it really has a heavy automotion, automation component to it. So if we go to... Let's just go here, go to uh, Tesla, and we'll call this uh, Tesla FSD, so fully self-driving um, setup here. You know, what is what is the core, like, high-level architecture? On one hand, you have the vehicles, so you have these cars here, lots of these cars, and this is basically the production deployment uh aspect of their system and then the other thing that you have is you have the place that will train the model and so this would be let's say the lab uh, component and one of the things that they're building actually is they're building a supercomputer called uh, dojo and this dojo is a uh, specialized chip so this is called ASIC and, and, and ASIC is uh, a chip that's designed specifically for a, part a particular task. And so in their case, they're building this supercomputer that can train their self-driving car uh, models. And so what this does is it allows it to have um, increased complexity of the model uh, where they don't need to necessarily... Uh, you know, wait as long to get feedback from, you know, increase more and more increasing complexity. So this is this is one one part of it is this this you know essentially lab environment with custom hardware, and this would be the train the train part would be their supercomputer, but also they have to deploy to their hardware that is the inference hardware. So we've got train hardware. Uh, and then we also have inference hardware, which is the part that does uh, the prediction. And the inference would be their board that is a uh, FSD, full self-driving board. And so the model would get pushed into this board. And that board of, can be simulated in the lab, but also the same board is in all of the production vehicles. And so the... The feedback loop is that uh, they have the ability to train, you know, increasingly more complex computer vision models that can detect the road and, you know, are able to detect vehicles and all those different things. And and they want to constantly go back and 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 make sure that they have the ability to iterate quickly. And as they're iterating through in the lab eventually they will want to do some kind of workflow that looks like this where they have this would be let's say the development environment here but then you would want to do a staging environment push and that what what happens in the staging environment is that you would take the code and you would push it into something called um, shadow mode and what shadow mode would do would be to to simulate what the prediction model would do uh, in in a real scenario, and so the vehicle can do two things. It can it can basically do the production uh, prediction, which is what's what it's using currently. But then, as new version, let's say the production version is 1.0, the shadow mode could be 1.1, and so it could be simulating. Look, here's what's actually happening and how I break and how I go faster. But we also want to take this shadow model and see is it being better at doing the, the kind of calculation. So 
I think the big the big takeaway with uh, a fully self driving system like this is that there must be a, a high level of full automation that occurs in order to you know keep making new models and putting them into production. So most people, when they think about computer vision, they're they're really focused on you know maybe the 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 model and the hyperparameters and 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 looking at all the different you know aspects of of this but in the, in a real world scenario here the entire feet the the high level system is is really what's important and that that you can automatically push the model to a lab environment to test things out and also also automatically push it into a, a staging environment where you can simulate you know you know what's happening so you know a good way to to let me just make a new diagram here a good way to think about this is that this this is ml ops and so if it's very difficult for someone to to have a real world computer vision system without having this ml ops philosophy and so you know what is you know what is the ml ops philosophy you know basically you you have some kind of elastic structure here that can handle uh you know everything from disk io to to storage to compute and that's why they're building their own um, training hardware uh, additionally you have uh, automation end to end so you have your code in let's say uh, a source control repo uh, and inside of this this repo you have different branches you know maybe you have the main branch you have the staging branch and you have the production branch and as those changes are pushed you have a build server that goes through and goes through a quality control check so we can call this qc or qa and and we would want to do all kinds of checks from you know is the software does this software work properly does the model um, give me the the correct accuracy uh, what about when I do a simulation you know does that work and, and so really with ML ops for computer vision uh, the the idea here is that if if you don't have a full automation of it of the entire system from the software to the modeling to the deployment to the vehicles then you really can't build a, a real world production system. There has to be a full automation feedback loop of, of each of the things. And even the training uh, aspect of things as well, that you know, that one of the things that has to be done is the data operations uh, side of things. So are you able to get the labels um, to be very highly accurate and really uh, clean data that segments the different parts of the road uh, identifies things correctly so that you can, can so you can continue to to train the model uh, successfully so if we go back to um, um, let's let's go back to this particular example here of um, of the the auto mill uh, system and that basically if we go down to you know high level this 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 diagram here is that what's important about a real world computer vision system is that it seems like only people when they talk about automation are focused on maybe some of the automation of the of the training like hyperparameter tuning or picking the, the correct um, you know algorithm but but a lot of the other parts have to be automated as well and that's one of the things that tesla brought up was that they had to build systems that could automatically detect the labels of the images and and give it very high value uh, high accuracy to the labeling also they have systems that uh, can look at let's say the cluster health for the training and give people a feedback loop. They can look at the cars as they're driving and give back monitoring instrumentation. Uh, also that they're they're constantly building uh, feature engineering so that they know exactly what are the things that they're gonna train on and that those features are built 
in a way that allows them to easily you know retrain the model and also that the software itself and the model has automatic testing and that the 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 model and the software can be automatically deployed very very quickly and then if they need to scale up they have some kind of they actually do use the AWS cloud uh, as well as their own physical infrastructure and so this this systems methodology uh, is critical to do real world computer vision and if you don't have all of these different things automated then you're you're really not going to be able to build a real world um, computer vision system and, and so this this is actually very uh, similar to to you know to to what's important to think about and and so this is I, I think what I mentioned uh, earlier that's important to be aware of is that really the competitive automation for ML ops and computer vision is the automation and and that uh, also one of the things that Tesla has is they have data that no one else has, right? Because they have all the vehicles that are out on the road and they're able to capture all that data. So unless you have that large of a um, sample uh, of data, they're going to have a competitive advantage. So really, I think the two things that are that are important uh, are the automation and then the actual data and the machine learning algorithms and all those things really seem to be less important uh, because that's more of a uh, commodity as it gets more automated. But the things that you can't uh, really, you know, compete with is if you if you have a larger set of data from more vehicles on the road, then you're going to have a, a competitive advantage. Likewise, if you can't automatically push your code into a production environment, then you're going to have real problems uh, scaling your, your system in the, in the real world. And so the other thing that I'll mention that's, that's important to be aware of is that, uh, the inside of Apple, you know, they have this thing, the, the Cormel tools, uh, example here and, uh, you know, app and then Google has the, uh, neural compute stick and, and I'm sorry, Intel has a neural compute stick and then, the Google has the TPU that all of these large companies as well are all building hardware around the, uh, the, the these computer vision workflows. And so I think this is this is really a big takeaway is that um, any any company that is is involved with um, computer vision, they they have a few different common things. One, is that they all have their own chips that they're 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 building. So every every main company that does computer vision, so Apple has their own chip, right? They have the uh, the A the A fourteen fifteen etc. Uh, Google has the uh, TPU, right? So they have the TensorFlow processing unit, and then uh, we also have um, Tesla now has their Dojo. Uh, right, and and so all of these companies are specifically building their own hardware for doing customized uh, computer vision. The other thing that's important to be aware of is the data, right? And so we'll call this vertical, vertically integrated, vertical uh, AI uh, integration integration for computer vision. So basically the data, who, who has the data? Well, Apple has uh, their, own, their own data from iOS. Um, Google has all the search data that they can feed into it. And then Dojo has the, uh, the vehicle data from all of the Tesla, the, the Tesla cars. And so these are now two things that are, that are, you know, make them have very tight vertical integration. Now, the next thing that they have is they they also have the ability to um, be able to have elasticity uh, for for what they're for what they're building. So in, in all of these cases, there's some kind of a, a cloud component uh, to it. And then and then finally, they have um, you know basically uh, automation, 
that that occurs. Uh, and so, so this is something I think you'll see across all vertically integrated AI companies that are doing computer vision is that they have their own, uh, and we'll call this ML apps. They have their own hardware. They have uh, their own proprietary data. They can scale and do elasticity, and then they they fully embrace automation. So, from like a, a project perspective, or a student perspective, or somebody wanting to do computer vision, this is probably a good checklist as well. So, are you able to have the ability to use custom hardware um, th that that is specifically designed for both training and inference? Uh, are you also working with maybe some uh, good data sets uh, you know if it's a if you're competing in a, in a new field like self-driving car it would be very difficult to compete if you don't have your own training data and then from elasticity right can you actually scale up to to do you know huge amounts of training with a computer cluster and then finally is every single aspect of what you're doing automated. So from a smaller project, you can you can basically use a lot of these things yourself, but it's just to be aware from a from a, a super high level uh, that these are important things to consider in, in a real world computer vision uh, project. So let's let's take a look here at um, how you could start to use, let's say a cloud environment next. And I'm gonna go to chapter seven of this practical MLOps book and just really briefly talk about a few different things that uh, I think could be important to consider. So the, the, the first thing that I think is an important thing to consider is that AWS is probably the, the main cloud that uh, I think many people should start with if you don't already have a preference. This is actually a picture of an architecture that I built uh, several years ago for a, another computer vision company. This was a company that would uh, capture a, a whole room using something called volumetric capture. So let me let me actually draw out what that looks like real quick. So this was a company that did something called volumetric capture. It's volumetric capture and, and what this does was that they would put this into a room so we'll just say this is a room like this and then inside of that room would be a lot of different cameras high, high res cameras and those cameras would, would basically capture you know people or uh, objects you know all, all of these these different things and then th all of that footage would go on to uh, a, a hard drive and I think maybe it was like nine terabytes of information or something like you know very large amount of information and then we would need to take that uh, all of those different uh, images let's say there was let's say a hundred cameras and each hundred cameras would need to be stitched together so that they would create a 360 degree view uh, of everything that's happening so that you could if you wanted to later render this out into a movie that you could use the um, you know like a, a camera for example uh, like a you know a headset camera and and you could you could basically do virtual reality right so you could do a VR uh, look up. And so the, the, the part that was computationally expensive was that the, all, all of those cameras that you would have to uh, basically stitch the, the pictures each frame by frame together to make the whole world view, a 360 uh, view. And so this was done via cloud computing. So basically what we did was we, we built uh, a queue in SQS, Amazon SQS, and then there would be a lot of workers that would go through, and each of the workers would do a little bit of work on on um, stitching together the problem. So that's what this particular picture is right here. Was this was the architecture of the system that we developed, and so what would happen was 
that depending on how much work that needed to be done, they would it would get put into this queue, and then this queue would spin up maybe 10, 100, 1,000 machines that would each grab work off of the queue. And when the work was done, it would put the end results actually into a elastic file system. And the elastic file system could grow and, and keep all of the, the finished um, uh, computer vision movies. And, and, and so what's nice about cloud computing is that you're able to build uh, a elastic infrastructure and so let me let me just show you what that elastic infrastructure look like for computer vision so we'll say AWS um, elastic infrastructure infrastructure so what are the things that are elastic? One is that the queue itself, uh, what's nice about Amazon's SQS is that it can handle infinite capacity. So basically, you you can't request or receive more information than it, that it can it can basically you can it can take almost any capacity and it can actually be consumed at almost any capacity. And so what that means is that, if I couple that with the EC2s, these uh, virtual machines here, is that each of these virtual machines um, is able to uh, spin up, and, and I could spin up from 10 to maybe 1,000 virtual machines, all grabbing messages and grabbing work to do that I needed to do on this project. When it's, when it's done, these virtual machines, if we just go to EC2 instance here, and we make a big virtual machines, they all uh, access the same uh, file system, the EFS Elastic file system here. And, and these EC2 instances would uh, be, be able to, to read uh, and write uh, the information to this Elastic file system, and the file system itself could grow. And so basically, maybe it started out with 100 megabytes, but you could actually build this to 100 terabytes easily uh, because all the different instances as they would spawn you know these ec2 instances and they would do their work they would just put their result back into the file system and so really there's there's three components that are that are fully elastic the the sqs the queue that can handle the work that needs to be done that's fully automatic and elastic the ec2 instances could again go to a thousand, ten thousand, however many instances I want to do the work, and then the file system itself, because they all shared the file system, they all could put the end results into the file system, and they wouldn't have to worry about capacity or disk I/O. So this is a really important um, aspect of doing real-world computer vision: is that you have the ability to talk to a cloud-type environment, so that you don't have to be worried about the constraints of, of scaling up and scaling down. Uh, and, and, and this is really, uh, I think, a, a requirement for, for any real world uh, computer vision infrastructure is to have the ability to scale elastically. And so, the, uh, yeah, that's exactly what we did when, when we built this out. And the client for this was actually a, a computer vision uh uh, headset like a H, I think it was called um, HTC Vibe uh, headset. So the other thing to consider as well is that if you think about this Costco analogy for uh, AWS, is that at Costco you can grab a pizza or you can build out your own pizza by getting the flour, or you can actually go to their catering department and just get you know basically a, a pizza that's already been pre-made same with aws is that you can actually use their off-the-shelf uh, computer vision solutions you can build it yourself like i was just showing you in this example uh, or you can actually go through and build maybe like a, a from scratch you know higher level service there's lots of different abstractions that you could think about when you're building things on the aws platform in particular, though, this, this idea of no-code, low-code, I think, is a good place to start. And so if, if we go to, let's just um, go to, uh, let's say, a Cloud9 environment here. 
for example, one of the things that uh, is neat about this AWS environment here is that uh, I can actually uh, go through here. Let's just clear this real quick. Let's refresh this. <clears throat> this in this environment um, allows me to to open up a shell and start to experiment with API calls. So, for example, if I said import Boto three, um, I could I could say recognition here like this. I can make an instance of the recognition API, and then I can pass it some kind of here we go i think this was one of the examples i did or bucket let's let's give it a bucket of an s3 um, image let's give it a name and then let's let's say labels would be this if i said show me the labels of some image it would go through and and be able to dynamically call that out and, and, and this is really a great way to prototype things on the cloud is to use the cloud-based development environment to talk to the rest of the cloud so that you are minimizing the, the difficulty of communicating with, with cloud services. And, and so I just showed you that's one example, but you can also just use their, their terminal and do things like AWS, maybe call the service, let's say it's S3, and I want to list all the buckets that are available. So the deep integration of these cloud-based development environments do allow you to, to really build things very, very quickly. And in particular, there's other parts of AWS that we can take a look at that allow you to prototype things out. So with say AWS console, as I mentioned, there's the high level uh, AWS services uh, like recognition which are are a decent place to start for doing computer vision so if i wanted to you know again look at toggle a couple different pictures here here here's a uh, an image that's dropped inside notice that it's able to detect all these different labels every single one of these labels and i could even download this this uh, label list if i wanted to and it would it would show me all of this um the, the, these these would be one way to do it the the other thing i could do as well is that uh, i could also just look at the uh, response here and see like what what it would look like if i was going to um, pull this into a service that i built but but what's 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 useful about this is that without me needing to build a very complex system i can f just immediately start to to take pieces of a computer vision problem like label detection and feed it to an external system and then start to build tools around it and focus on the automation. Uh, the other thing too is I could, for example, maybe feed it text images and notice that it can grab the text out of these sample images or, you know, like the license plate number. And then I could even combine it with other high level systems on AWS. So for example, this is a, um, comprehend which is their natural language processing system let's say at first i would look at images and find text in them because maybe i want to interpret road signs for example uh, for self-driving car then i could feed the text that it pulled out and then put this into a, a model like this and let's just say you know highway one uh, traffic ahead or something you know uh, it could it could look at a it could look at a, a real world system here and then you know figure out how to extract the entities out and then I could do things with this uh, as well. So the 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 high level uh, AI services I think are a good place to start when you're when you're experimenting with a computer vision system and and, and because you can build out this kind of an infrastructure where there's just three core components maybe SQS the ec2 instances and then the file system then you can then build on top of that very easily by using the off-the-shelf uh, tools so so for example this could be version 1.0 of your computer computer vision system is that you basically focus on getting the feedback loop working for automation that's the first task that you do and so 
what, what that means is that you want to make sure that you have the elastic scalability built in. So you, you know, use only, only services that have elasticity like, you know, SQS and spot instances and also um, the uh, file system. Once you've got that set up, then maybe you would want to use the high level services first. So we'll, we'll call this AI APIs and the AI APIs could be the computer vision one, which is the recognition. And then the other one uh, could be the uh, comprehend, which would be NLP. And the NLP one would be comprehend. And, and what's, what's neat about this is that then you could focus on maybe deploying the microservice uh, that would be your end product that would give some kind of a, a, a prediction. And, and then basically you can, you could focus on making sure that you have, you know, a high quality microservice that is automatically deployed using, let's say DevOps best practices where you're doing continuous integration, continuous delivery, right? You're testing your code and pushing it to production. And, and this would be, I think, the, one of the best ways to initially build a prototype. And for a student project, this could be a great place to start is focus on getting the full end-to-end -end system built and prototyped out so that you can then later make it more and more uh, complex. And so uh, I actually cover this in the same chapter as I, I talk about this is that when you, when you start to build something, on the AWS platform, these high-level tools are a great place to start. And then also I would recommend thinking about picking a project that is the simplest possible project that does automatic deployment uh, of, your, of your code. And so what that would look like in a nutshell would be you would have your code in GitHub, you would have the AWS code build system, you know, listen to every change that you make, every time you do a push event, it would then go through and take your static um, markdown files, uh, build those files into a website, and then push those files into uh, Amazon S3. And so you could get a, a feel for what the simplest possible continuous delivery pipeline would work like, which is building a, a static website. So I think this is a good project to build uh, if you haven't built uh, a website before that automatically deploys because it, it uses uh, things that are also elastic. So Amazon S3, you can never f overfill it. Essentially, it's so big of a system that it can elastically scan, you know, handle the writes and also elastically handle the reads of data. And so if you're able to automatically deploy code to it, that's a great, uh, you know, production uh, you know, set up to initially master. And you can see here, this is a uh, file that shows the build process of building the code into a production environment. And you can see there that I grab the Hugo binary, which will convert the markdown to HTML. Uh, I move it somewhere. I run the command Hugo, which builds a website. And then to push it to production, all I do is this. I just sync, I just sync this code into the S3 bucket. Once I've done, then then I'm able to test it out. Now you also can use the AWS Cloud9 environment as a good way to, to, to test things out, which I was just playing around with here. But in general, I think prototyping a build system is one of the best ways to get started. So I'm gonna show you an example of this real quick. Let's um, open up another one. So this is a, a website that I have uh, that, that I automatically deploy code to. And here we go, this website data. And so this repo right here, I went to AWS and I told their build system to, to listen to it. So if I go to code build right here, this is that service. Um, one of the things that I have is that notice that it, it's linked to this website right here right here so you can see that it's linked to this and and what happens is that every time I make a change to it it will trigger a new build process 
and we can go ahead and look at this real quick and see what the build spec YAML file looks like. And so you can see here that I tell it what version of software to download and how to download it, how to push it, and then finally how to synchronize my code to a production environment when it's done. So all these steps are, happen automatically uh, every time I make a change. So if I go back here, for example, and I just make a, real, a small change to this uh, project, and let's go here, let's go to this. You can see it's just a plain, uh, this is like a plain text file. And if I wanna take a dot out or put a dot in, I can just go down here, commit this change, and then over uh, on this uh, code build environment, if I refresh it, you'll see that, look, it's already pushing this change. It's making uh, a build pro uh, process. So if I click on it, um, let's actually just click on this. We can actually scroll down to the build logs and I can even watch it uh, you know, while it's being deployed. And, and so this concept would work the exact same for a computer vision project or a microservice. And that's why I would recommend using something like this to get familiar with the concept of continuous delivery because it simplifies the problem in a way that's that's really clear to many people is that I have a file that's a markdown file I run some software that converts that file to an HTML file and I put it into s3 that's a pretty straightforward process to be able to understand um, and it's all done uh, automatically and then later uh, you know it gets it gets pushed into s3 and then later I I'm able to to grab it out so let's go ahead and take a look at s3 real quick so if I go to this and we look at uh, this, this S3 location, all that happens inside of here is that uh, if I think I take, a, take my name here, gift.com, here we go, right? You, you can see that this is a publicly accessible bucket and every time I make changes, it just puts all the all those files inside of this lo location here, and I'm able to serve out the, those assets via um, the. This thing has got a. Um, uh, it creates a URL right here, a static website hosting URL, and and then that uh, domain uh, goes and corresponds to my my website. If I click it, there we go. You can see that 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 that's the result of it. But basically. All of this is happening via the build system, which is this um, code build. Uh, and so it would be very similar, again, to how you would do it in a, in a real-world computer, computer vision project. So that's why I would recommend this would be a good one to start with so that you understand how to set up full and, and continuous delivery of a project. And it really isn't that much more complex when you're doing this for a computer vision project once you understand the basic of continuous delivery, which is every time I make a change, something will listen to the change, build the new system, and then deploy that that change to to production. So, let's let's take a look at um, you know one of the things to be aware of in cloud computing, and one of them is that it really at the center of many of the things you do with cloud computing is you have a function, which is a unit of work and things go into the function, you will process it, and then you will return back the result. So, you know, you can do things like talk to a GPU, you can do microservices, uh, you can build command line tools, you can do multi-processing, you can use uh, decorators, um, you can apply things to do data engineering, and you also can um, talk to serverless technology all all of it is really just a Python function. And uh, in particular, one of the ones I like to do is um, build something like this, which is uh, a small handler that allows you to uh, ex basically accept an event. In this case, this is the, the main event. And you say, if this event exists, then return back uh, the word polo. If it doesn't, return back the word the word no so I can build this really quickly if I go to AWS and we can go to Lambda 
and, and build out one of these lambda functions. So I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. There we go, create a function. And I can say, okay, let's build one from scratch. And we'll call this uh, hello Python. I can build the runtime Python 3.9. One thing to be aware of is if I, if I did wanna use this for calling, let's say a computer vision API, that I would need to change the default uh, execution rule here. And normally if you're creating a new one, you can just use the basic permissions. But if I needed to, let's say, do something more sophisticated, what I might need to do is talk to S3, talk to recognition, you know, talk to IoT buttons or SQS or whatever it is I need to do. So it's it's important to be aware that if you are doing more sophisticated things with this, you you have to point it to the right security permissions. But I would I'll just do this, which is make a new rule, and then once I build this uh, lambda function to to get started with with building it out functionality is pretty straightforward because you can you can use it all inside the console and so if I go to this code here and I want to just change it I could just take out some things you know kind of build yeah, basically build a, a some work that says if event um, name for example is equal to um, Marco then we can say return back the word polo. Otherwise, we can return um, no, right? So we've got that. And then I could just click on this deploy button here and deploy that change. And then to test it, I would just click the test button here and just call this uh, Marco. And then go here and just put in a payload. To, to be able to test it. So we can say, you know, name is equal to Marco, like that. Go ahead and create it, test it, and there we go. We can see that it returns back Polo. If I wanna do a different test event, and I wanna test a, a new one, we can say, um, uh, like, no payload, or, or no payload. And then we could change this to Bob or something, some other word, and create it. And then it would we could test this out. We could say, yeah, there we go, test this, and should return back no. There we go, right? Because we know from the function that it will it will match on the, that word. So this is a very intentionally simple example of of why the lambdas are so powerful to prototype out computer vision pipelines because you could just now start to put in any code you want. You could talk to the recognition, talk to comprehend, talk to other services like SageMaker, and then easily prototype these out. The other thing you can do that's, that's really powerful about cloud computing, this is how I built the very large scale computer vision pipeline, was I added a trigger, and the trigger could be uh, maybe a gateway, it could be IoT, it could be voice activation. Uh, it also could be um, the SQS system. And SQS, what's great about it is that the Lambda functions can listen to all the events. And so you could have something really shoveling in hundreds of thousands of messages per second. And, and let's say that each of them was uh, something you wanted to be labeled, or like maybe from a self-driving car system. And then you could actually feed it this queue and then basically call the Amazon's uh, computer labeling system, the recognition system, and then basically take all those results and then put those labeled results into a database somewhere like maybe uh, a DynamoDB database. So the, the triggers, I think, are a very important you know, aspect of why lambdas are, are an important part of an elastically built, built uh, pipeline. Uh, and, and so again, this is something I could just, you know, play around with right here. Now, I also could go, if I went back to here, that I can actually invoke those Lambda functions remotely as well. So for example, if I go to AWS and I go to Lambda, the one that I just built, I think is called Python Hello. Let's see if it shows up. It would be 
let's look. Oh no, hello Python. So let's see if we there we go. Hello Python. That's the one I just built. And if I write, I can I can basically click this and say either download it and play with it inside of here, or I can even invoke this um, it remotely. Uh, and I think you can just put the payload right here. Let's let's try this payload here. Let's do um, hello world. Yeah, like this. So I can basically do the same thing and invoke it and say name is equal to Marco. And let's go ahead and invoke it. And there we go. We can see that I'm able to actually invoke it uh, you know, from this console as well. So I think Lambda is probably one of the best prototyping solutions for really, really, really quickly building something that's a solution. Uh, and I think I have a few examples of this inside of this repo, which is Edge Computer Vision repo. And, and you can see that uh, I believe I have an example here of uh, essentially you can write a handler that could listen to um, maybe bucket requests, right? So every time I put a, an image into a bucket that it would actually um, invoke the recognition API just like this and then it would call out and, and, and do the labeling automatically. So that's another architecture that someone could do if they were building, you know, they needed to get, build a, a, a fully automatic labeling system is that they could uh, write this code. That's, it's only a few lines of code that can detect the labels and put those labels uh, somewhere and, and then basically tell the Lambda handler to, to always be called every single time a new image is put into a bucket. So it can handle, you know, tens of thousands, a hundred thousand, a million requests, uh, all via this um, uh, asynchronous event. And that's really one of the powerful things about building things with the cloud-based uh, building blocks. You know, on the AWS platform, how would you use it to deploy models? Uh, so with AWS, there, there really is a, a variety of ways that you can deploy models. One of them is to use a platform. So you can use a, a platform tool like, for example, SageMaker. That's one way to do it. Um, the other one uh, that you can use is the uh, microservice. Uh, and so uh, in, in this example, you know, it could be something like AWS Lambda. And so AWS Lambda could uh, reference maybe a model that lives inside of the uh, S3 location and it pulls it out and it does a prediction. Uh, another is actually like a, like a high level app, uh, an app service. And we're gonna talk about this in a second, uh, but that could be for, for example, something called App Runner. And in, and in this example, the SageMaker, this would basically orchestrate behind the scenes a whole series of you know cluster uh, operations. Uh, in the case of microservice, the microservice would would be able to uh, in, in pull a model that maybe lives in the S3 location, and then App Runner would be. A, I would call this like a container as a service type offering. And so let, let's, let's go ahead and take a look at each of those things here. So we already went through how you could use the, um, the APIs uh, and that's one potential solution for this. But uh, another thing to be aware of is this concept of container as a service. And in particular, what's great about container as a service uh, is that you're able to uh, keep all of your code inside of the source control repository. And you can also put the Docker file, which could be the runtime of your project. And then you also could basically put the configuration data for you know, how the virtual machines are created or what uh, SQS queue you use or how something could be configured in the cloud. 
and then every time you make a change that container registry will will actually uh, build out a new version of the runtime which has all your code and the packages necessary and then it also could communicate with a machine learning module, mod, module registry and then you could run that in the cloud and have a machine learning endpoint so i think this is probably a very common one uh, for for many organizations doing machine learning in the cloud is this this concept of container as a service and really some of the advantages of this is that a developer could mimic production uh, in, on their on their own uh, desktop they also allows you to use software like docker hub to you know, basically simulate what's happening and then also github is the source of truth for doing deployment and then also you can easily use these high level services like one of them is fargate that's one of the services that can do container as a service you develop on cloud nine you then go through and uh, push that uh, container into cloud storage and then you have a microservice and here's an example of a very simple microservice that could be deployed uh, that doesn't do machine learning just like a uh, a change function and you could see I could build out you know an endpoint and I could call it and then when I do the actual uh, integration with Fargate uh, I could run my app put this all together and then it gives me a URL that I could run now locally I could also run that same thing in a docker uh, runtime and, and that's one of the neat things about using this container as a service offerings is that they allow you to really replicate exactly what will happen in a cloud-based environment uh, probably a, an easier one that 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 i think many people would benefit from is using something called aws app runner and what app runner does is allows you to hook up a source and or a container a repository it'll automatically build it out for you build out the ecosystem give you a, a review dashboard and then it, it will give you the service an encrypted um, and secure url and really the steps to do that would just be install the software um, run the application or run the microservice and then uh, communicate with the with the right uh, port here and so here's a, a picture of what that would look like right as you can see here's the domain and here's the repo that it was talking to and now it's downloading it and then i can also call out and make requests to it so if we go to this app runner let's go take a look at it real quick here edaboost app runner uh it, it's pretty straightforward to to set it up you just click on this button create an app runner and notice what it's going to ask you is do you want to use a container registry where basically the pre-built containers are 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 going to be the source of truth or do you just want to give it a, an actual repository with your source code and in this case i could actually i could actually feed it to um i have a mlops cookbook example let's see here practical book I might have to look at the name of this repository let's see so Python MLOps cookbook okay so we'll say Python MLOps cookbook there we go so if I went to this and then it's going to ask me do I want to do manual change or do I want to do an automatic I think this is probably the best uh, approach is automatic so basically anytime I would make a change to the source control repo it would trigger a new deployment of the project so this would be continuous delivery and then for the runtime um, I could basically pick between Python 3 or node just like this and then to build it uh, I, I would just do the installation right so I'd say pip install dash r requirements um, txt something like that and then the start command would be whatever runs the application in this case i think it, it would be something like python app.py so this would run the microservice 
<clears throat> and really that's it that's all i have to do and if i click next it'll go behind the scenes and deploy this change uh, into a cloud-based environment now you can see kind of what it would look like right it would be it would look something like this when it's running um, and then i have fully deployed my machine learning application now probably a good way to start with would be again if you want to get comfortable with before you do the machine learning part is you could take this little bit of code here and and throw like a more simple example up just so you get like a rest endpoint and you can understand how the ecosystem works then and and, and there's a link to it right here you could you could you could click at this um, example but i think it's better to start with something simple first get the deployment working then once you've got that working then you can move on to uh, like a more complex example. So let's scroll down here and, and take a look at um, another option uh, as well would be the hardware. So you could you could use the the microservice to do your your prediction. Another solution would be to get all the way into one system, which is the um, AWS Deep Lens system. And what's neat about this is very similar to, let's say, a Tesla example where there's, you know, Tesla has these eight cars and the, the machine learning systems are reading all those signals and doing things with it. In this case, this is a very small, you know, example where you have a camera uh, and this camera is uh, accepting the images from the computer vision system. You're then doing the predictions on the device and then you can actually use it as a prototyping tool and so this is a good example of what happens when you hook it up is that depending on what model you load in real time it's able to detect you know a bottle a dining table you know etc a person and, and put all those labels you know in real time uh coming from the the inference on your on your camera and then it would take those results and because it's got integration with the cloud the packets would arrive in real time just as the objects get detected in the stream and then they get sent into their this iot uh, interface here and so i could then attach maybe a lambda function to that and listen to that um, topic and then take all those messages and put them into let's say a relational database or a key value database or maybe directly into object storage and so this is a neat way to also kind of get right down into computer vision in in a in the smallest possible form factor where it's got a complete solution for doing end-to-end -end machine learning so so this is another I, I think decent uh, example of of, some, of one way you could do real world um, computer vision on AWS. Now let's talk about the ML ops uh, example a little bit. In that, you know, as I mentioned before, that with a company like Tesla, automation is really an important part of how they're building things, and that has to be the mindset from the very beginning. So using the cloud one of the things to be aware of is that it, you should start with a cloud-based development environment so that you're able to leverage all of the deep integrations and i went through some of those like how you can interact with the cloud services once you develop then you want to push those changes to their high level system like app runner elastic beanstalk fargate maybe lambda whatever it is you're building and then uh, also have a build system listen to the trigger and push those changes into a, a production environment and then your source of truth would be the github environment and the github would have a make file and have a requirements file so basically you get this really rich feedback loop um, by using a cloud uh, environment and developing in in the cloud and so Let's take a look at, um, for example, how you would do that. Uh, basically, one, one example is if I wanted to build my own Elastic Beanstalk environment, I could just run this command here, right, which is eb init, and I could actually, inside of my AWS Cloud environment, tell this 
the, these um, cloud environments to spin up. I could put a configuration file like this together, and then now it would do continuous delivery, you know, very simply. Uh, I think a, an even easier way to think about this would be to think about it from a cookbook perspective. And in this particular example here, we can see that in order to build out like a structure for a project, that this might be one approach is that you have all your code in uh, the GitHub repo, you have continuous integration, continuous delivery of maybe artifacts. And these are just things that developers can use. But then in terms of prediction, you could predict with a microservice, like a Flask microservice. You could, you could do a prediction with a uh, command line tool, or, or you could also do a prediction with a container. All of these are, are appropriate ways to, to, to do things. Uh, the other one to be aware of is that you can also have um, the ability to containerize uh, your project and deploy to lots of different cloud environments or different services. So once you've created a structure like this, it's very easy to to kind of go go in many different directions. So let's talk about each of the the main components that I would recommend in a machine learning project. So first, I would recommend a make file here where you basically are using these commands like an installation command, a test command, maybe a lint command. And, and what's nice about this is that if you always use these same high level commands that you can slightly change maybe what, what's inside of these recipes. And, and it's easy to tell some other, some other person on your team, you know, every time you use my code, just say make install and it'll install the packages versus telling them a whole bunch of commands that they would need to run same as if you were telling someone to test your code, just say make test, and then it would go through and it would it would it would test the code. Uh, so make file is very important for re reproducibility. The requirements file is where you would pin your versions of your software, and this is really important for the real world production deployment. Is that you want to validate that your software packages are a specific version so that there aren't security vulnerabilities or that you're going to introduce uh, incompatible library changes. That's what this um, this does here is is you pin those numbers. The other thing that I think is is useful is that you know if you use a command line tool inside of your project, then you could be potentially load in your library. That, that does your machine learning, and you could uh, eliminate the complexity of needing to talk to the Flask microservice. You could just test out how the prediction works via command line. And so I think this is also a good idea is when you're building projects is to, you know, essentially, you know, have the ability to to communicate with with other utilities and 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 even build command line tools that allow you to, let's say, retrain your model uh, or maybe talk to a production endpoint. And, and, and so command line tools, I think, are a very good part of building projects. Now, the application file here is where the microservice would do its prediction. And notice, again, I import this machine learning library that I built. And then now all I have to do is in one line of code, I can do a prediction. Right, so this is another good uh, best practice is if we look at this um, model handling library that notice that I grab the model off of the disk, I read in some data, I have some code that does retraining, um, I have something that formats the input, uh, I have something that scales the input, it scales the target, I can convert things to a different inches or or, or whatever formatting that I need to do, I can make a human readable payload. Basically, I have a bunch of um, helper code in here so that now when I go back to my application, look, imagine if I had 200 lines of code in here, it would be very confusing, right? I would have to look all over the place to, to find out what's happening. But because I put all the machine learning handling code in a library, I can just in one line of code do a prediction. And then similarly, I can also build a command line tool, right, that 
that also can do a prediction in one line of code, right? As I, I pull in some, some data here and I do um, predict, right? Which is result predict, I say from MLlib import predict. So you can bake, make lots of different interfaces to your machine learning library. And this, uh, I think, allows you to let multiple people work on your project from developers to people in production and also helps you debug things. Now this uh, also is another aspect of it is that this would be where the um, uh, the, lib the actual model could live. If it's small enough, you could just put this into your Git repository. If it's bigger, it may st be stored in, let's say, SageMaker, or it could be stored in um, Amazon S3. And then finally, the Docker file, uh, I think is an important one to be aware of, is that this shows all of the different runtime characteristics of the application. So, you know, what version of Python is it running? Uh, are the packages installed? Where does the production application live? In this case, it would live in slash app, app.py. What are the um, ports that are exposed? What's the command that's run when it, when it actually gets executed? So all this runtime stuff is where you would put that information in a Docker file. And then if another thing to be aware of is you also could create a, um, a notebook that shows maybe somebody else on your team exactly how you came up with your machine learning model. And that way, if somebody needed to get into the machine learning part of your project, they could look at your notebook and, and, and experiment with it and maybe even try their own ideas uh, out about exactly you know what they wanted to do. So I think it, it is important to have a structure like this where you, you have all these different components and they're very distinct about what problem that they solve. And then here's an example of the command line tool, you know, in action is notice that, uh, again, I can test out things very quickly by having a command line tool without having to make web requests and do curl and all these other complicated commands. So let's, let's take a look at this. So if I go to this environment here and I want to um, uh, experiment with the code, what I could do is that I, I've got this checked out here, so you can see this is the uh, Python cookbook repo, that uh, I could actually do this command, CLI, and do a help to just see what it does. So, so again, anybody on my team could look at this, look at the documentation, it says it predicts the height of a Major League Baseball player based on the weight, so it's telling me just pass in the weight. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. And I think if I do um, CLI, I can do weight. So if we say 200 pounds, it will come back with a prediction and it even colors the output, right? It says six foot two. If I was a baseball player and I weighed 300 pounds, how tall would I be? Probably I would be six foot eight, right? So it, it, it's able to, to do a prediction based on uh, my height by using, again, the command line tool, which does if you notice here, it, there's not a lot of code in this command line tool. It only um, handles the options, and then I use the library to do all the work. So really, it, it does very little, but it makes it very easy for me to try out new ideas. Now notice as well that I can also, if I wanted to, I could retrain the model and 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 try things out that way. And that's what all this, the, the model, retraining does. So let's go ahead and take a, this example here. This Let's say I want to try out a new idea for training the model. So we'll do this like this. Retrain the model and notice that I told it I want to have a larger training set size, right? And here's an example of this. And then uh, notice that it shows me what the name of the model was that was retrained. Uh, and it also shows me what the new accuracy was. So basically, if I keep changing this, it's going to give me slightly different accuracy, right? Lower or higher, um, depending on you know what I'm what I'm trying to to solve. Uh, but but basically, these 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 command line tools uh, I think are a very powerful way to to also have hooks into your system to to make sure that it's doing exactly what you want it to do when you're when you're building uh, 
building your system. Now, the uh, again, the, the part that does all the heavy lifting is that the library itself it really handles so much of this work and makes it really easy for me. Um, now, the other thing I could do is if, if with this 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 uh, command line tool here, notice that if I go to the utils command line tool, which is a second command line tool, that one of the things that it can do is that it can actually um, also talk to a uh, external URL and actually handle everything for me in terms of doing a, 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 a payload because it uses the request library to, to do a, a payload request. And so uh, similarly, if I first get this thing running, so let's say that I do Python app.py or something like this, notice that now it's running here onto, onto my system and and what's what's great about that is that it's able to um, you know essentially serve it out locally and then if I want to I can actually open up a new terminal here and then um, source this this environment so we can do CV and activate and then go into this cookbook and then do utils CLI and then if I do help I can actually just determine so it says um, and if I want to do uh, predict and let's let's ask for help for this it's gonna say the weight that I want to pass in and the host so this would be the the host that it's running on so we know that this is running on this URL, which is I think is localhost actually. Um, so if I go here, we should be able to say predict host, and I could even do probably I'll add localhost here, localhost, and then. Um, I would say dash dash wait, and then we'll say 200. And it didn't like that. Let's see here. Let's see if this. Oh no, we need to do this. We need to. We, I need to add in a predict. So I need to give it the exact URL where the the prediction is working. There we go. Okay, so now we can see that I was able to query that endpoint, and you can see that it's right here, right? So we can see that, 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 and this is just locally. So then later, if I do a deployment, and I push that change into the, um, let's say, AWS app service, it would work very similar, is that I don't have to really do a lot of work. I just give it the URL of where that project is working, right? It could be uh, on my... My, on my uh, local station here. It could be in Docker somewhere. It could be on somebody else's machine. It could be in um, SageMaker. It, 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 and what's ne well, that's what's neat about building these command line tools like this is it really saves you a lot of time in, in prototyping up your solutions. So I'm going to go ahead and, and kill that. Uh, and a few other things to be aware of as well is that you... Uh, may want to consider linting your Docker file. And here's an example of what this would do. Uh, and by linting this Docker file, uh, that's one way of ensuring that maybe I wanted to build a high quality container, containerized microservice, and then I test this out. And, and really this is an important thing to be aware of is that one of the things that's nice about a container plus a command line tool is that it's it's one of the best ways to deploy your project internally into uh, a company. So, a couple other things to point out here in terms of deploying your your model is that uh, Flask itself, uh, which is what I'm using for the microservice, is doing all the heavy lifting. But notice that 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 basically that this library is 
that's that's the one call that does the machine learning. Everything else here is basically just you know boilerplate code. There's this this is just kind of a hello world function, but this app here it, it takes this endpoint, it accepts a post request, so it accepts a JSON payload. I pass all that into this predict function. That's it, and it, it, it's able to serve this out. And you saw this earlier. This is when I was running it locally under localhost, and then I had the command line tool uh, test it out. Now notice that, I mean, sometimes a, another way that you could do the same thing is to build a, a small little bash tool. So uh, I do, do do that sometimes as well. So like if we look, notice here that there's a, um, there should be a, a function here called predict. Yeah, so we double click this. Notice that all this does is it says, here's my port and then I do a command line curl command and then this would be localhost and so if I do the same thing if I run this again let's um, run the the microservice uh, I could also go to this and just do dot slash predict and the seed there we go that that does a, a prediction uh, as well a command line prediction so you know there, there's a bunch of different ways that you could you could you know, work with uh, testing and prototyping your tool, building bash command line um, tools, building uh, Python command line tools, deploying them automatically using containers. But in, in a nutshell, if you build things in a modular way, it makes it easier to, to prototype it and try out different technologies. And in particular, the containerized Flask microservice uh, I think is is a good way to deploy your code because it works on so many different places. It could work on a Windows laptop. It could work on the cloud environment. It could work locally. And another thing you can do is you can actually build that container via GitHub Actions and even push, let's say, a machine learning um, a container into, let's say, the GitHub container registry and actually give that to other people. So here's an example of, this is the steps that I would take to build a GitHub uh, project, push it automatically, and notice that every time I make changes to this project, it'll automatically push uh, a new version of container. And I think we can see this, if I go to um, actions here, inside of this Python MLOps cookbook, notice that I have um, multiple workflows, and in particular, if I click on this, notice that I do a build and I do a build container. And what the container does is it pushes this into this GitHub registry right here. And then as a result of this, that I could have people uh, do a Docker pull of, the, of this container and, and actually uh, use it, uh, <coughs> yeah, and actually, and actually use this, um, th this code here. And, and in fact, I think I can say GitHub container. Yeah, here we go. So if you do this, if you did this, for example, Docker pull, we could, I believe, even test it out on this environment. Let's see if we can do this. So I'm gonna change into I'm just going to do it from right here. I'll just I'll say Docker pull. Let's pull this down locally. Let's see what happens. It's able to pull that from uh, GitHub. And, and what's nice about this is that most people have some Docker uh, interaction with their system uh, that's ready, and and then I don't even have to necessarily do anything uh, other than. Um, Run run the pull command, and then to let's let's look at my instructions here. Docker, let's look at the Docker 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 build Docker. Yeah, so let's do this. Let's try to let's try to run it locally now. So we'll we'll say Docker image ls and we can see that that's the name of this um, of this docker uh, image 
And so I'm going to just swap this name out, which is this. There we go. And then I can also invoke this container easily this way as well. So if I paste this in, docker run dash p run port 8080. Okay, so it looks like that port may already be in use port 8080 because I still have this running, right? So I'm gonna kill this process and then I'm gonna run it again and that should hopefully work. Okay, so now it's running in a Docker container. And again, this is the one that was packaged by GitHub. And then if I want to just do a prediction, we can just do the bash prediction. So I can do uh, predict like that. There we go. And now it's able to predict against this Docker container as well. So uh, to me, I think the big, the big takeaway here, and now I'm stopping it, is that once you're able to modular light, create a modular um, process for your 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 um, your code and, and let's just look at this real quick so it's that if we go all the way back up here that y if you're using this kind of a structure for your project where you you know you basically have all these assets inside you can do continuous integration you can do containerize your, your project. You can do lots of different uh, endpoints from a web microservice to a command line tool to a container, which we was just playing with. And then you can also deploy it to different targets. And a lot of it is just this formula of a make file, requirements file, command line tool, a Docker file, uh, having the model inside. So I think this is a very good example of a structure that you could use for for almost any uh, in machine learning prediction. So let's kind of scroll down to the bottom here of this chapter and look at now, how would I take this and make it the easiest possible you know, production deployment on AWS? I think the AWS app runner um, Flask microservice is probably the best way to go. And you can see here, this is exactly this repo, this Python MLOps cookbook repo. Notice that I have the source code repo right here. And then I just say, I want to add this repo. There we go. We can see the branch is main. I do automatic, right? So I click on the uh, automatic push. Uh, and then once it's deployed, you can, I can easily use that command line tool to do all the work for me because if you remember, I can swap out the URL. And so this would, I would just swap out the URL that I used earlier with the, the new deployed URL, which would be whatever the deployment service creates. And then this again is end-to-end -end encrypted. And notice that I could then query and, and test out this prototype. So for, a, I would say for a real world uh, production environment, this is probably one of the best options would be, you know, create all the structure, get the containerized work version working, get the command line tools working, make sure you can experiment with it, but then hook up this thing so that automatically every single time you're pushing changes, those changes would, you know, you know, basically go into your your system. Now, uh, the, an another alternative solution for using machine learning on AWS, it would be to do Lambda and I've also shown examples of how to do this uh, in this in this same repo. But basically, the way you would do this is they have something called SAM, which is stands for the uh, serverless um, application. Uh, and w with this SAM uh, environment, you would just say SAM init, SAM local invoke, and then from here it would create a, a layout like this. So you would have a readme file, you have events right here, you would have, you know, a, a, like a hello world, uh, an app file, requirements, all these things get put into a structure. And then what you do is you would then, if you needed to, you could also containerize it. And so here's an example of, um, again, putting this library inside of this containerized version. Notice that I have a Docker file here where I basically copy the uh, Python 3.8 uh, 
uh, container. I put all the different files inside of this. I also tell it that I want to install the packages. And then now that it's set up here, I can deploy this containerized uh, microservice uh, and look at this is the, the cloud formation template uh, using their SAM language. And so it says AWS template format, serverless. Here we go. This says the, the prediction endpoint. It even shows us what version of Docker. And then at the very end here, you can see that I just do SAM build and I say SAM de deploy guided. And, and then I can even invoke it in a simulation mode so that uh, I can actually test out what it would do when it's deployed into an AWS Lambda. And you can see this, this is how you do that. And, and I would just pass in a payload.json. So in this case, I think I created this as well, uh, payload.json inside of here. I thought I did payload.json. Um, here we go. Predict. Yeah, there you go. So there. Uh, so this was like a subdirectory of that exact project. And if you go to payload.json, you can see it's just a JSON file that that you could use to do this. Uh, and then once you've done that, you're you're able to 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 test it out. Then what you could do is you could actually deploy this into production and then push this. And so basically, you're containerizing your your machine learning project and then pushing it into the AWS Lambda console. And then you can actually test it out um, basically by, uh, by actually using all of the, the console tools that, that I showed earlier. Uh, and then another way to invoke it, there's two other ways. One is that you can also use the AWS uh, environment to, to invoke it. So let's go ahead real quick and just see like that uh, again, if you go to your deployed Lambda service, this was the one uh, that I was playing with earlier, but if I right click on it, you can go to any AWS service and just invoke it. And then it'll open up um, basically this this uh, console here, which is, let's, let's get rid of these. There we go, invoke it. It'll open this up. And basically you can either select a file to use as a payload or you can actually just build your own payload. And, and, and I think in this case, I can just start with the hello world again and, and just kind of overwrite it, right? And just put in, you know, name. Obviously, if this was the machine learning uh, example, it would be slightly different, um, but, but not that much dissimilar, right? But, but this is neat because once you deployed it, then you can start invoking, you know, services uh, you can start invoking services, you know, in, into your production environment and test the feedback loop. Another way to test it, which a lot of people use as well, is to use a service called um, or tool called Postman. And a lot of people will do this once you've deployed it, the microservice, it's up there, is that you may get a Postman uh, utility, which lets you save all the configuration data. And then once you've got that saved, you can invoke this uh, and and kind of play around with exactly what's happening. So, I guess in a nutshell, you know, some of the the main takeaways here for AWS is that container as a service is probably one of the best ways to deploy your code. And, and I showed a bunch of different examples from App Runner to um, even Lambda. You can deploy as a container. Now SageMaker is another one that depending on what kind of problem you're solving, it can be real helpful because uh, it can do the auto ML capabilities and also it allows you to um, manage the complexity of the endpoints, so serving out the production endpoints. And then in terms of um, serverless, you know, that's, that's another uh, technology that allows you to either use a pre-trained model in, in some cases or use a technology like uh, Lambda. Uh, and so let's just really briefly, let me go back to this uh, SageMaker example here that I was covering earlier, which is this, that the, really the, the big advantage of something uh, like uh, SageMaker 
uh, over, let's say, the, the lighter weight stuff that we did was depending on uh, what problem you're solving, if you can actually really quickly load in the data from S3, just select the target you want to predict, tell it to automatically create the model, tune it correctly, and then get full visibility and control, then you can look at a leaderboard and kind of select the best models to to put to to push into production and so it, it really handles the end-to-end -end feedback loop i think uh, a lot better uh, and and that's that's one of the advantages of using something like SageMaker. notice as well that the other thing that that sage maker has uh that's that's pretty cool is that if we look at you know the the ability to deploy is if you're setting up all this automation and you already have things sorted out so they work well with SageMaker, then it really, you would just maybe go home at night, have it run a bunch of tests overnight, you come back, you look at the one with the best accuracy, and then you just right click on it, say deploy model, and then you deploy that model into maybe a staging environment and, and test it out. So there's there's a lot of options on AWS depending on which which level of complexity you want to build. I think if you wanted to start somewhere, that this um, MLOps cookbook is probably one of the better places to to start because it gives you like a scaffolding of you know what are the key components that you should have. Uh, you know this is intentionally a very very simple project so that it's educational, but the concepts I think are are very similar to other people that would do real world machine learning, including companies like, let's say, Tesla.